Okay, we're looking today at exercise 10 in MacDill for both James 1 and 1 Thessalonians 4. And the directions at the top say the Spirit of God inspired His Word to meet real needs of real people. Humbly and <clears throat> request His enablement to see the needs of the original audience as He saw them and then to see those needs, same needs, in contemporary society. So let's do that. Father, we thank you that you are a God who meets the needs of your people, who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Lord Jesus, because you too were tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. I pray that you would help us to see how the texts that we're looking at today address the original audience and how those same needs exist in the contemporary audience. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so it's, I think, obvious that every text was written to address a specific need in the original audience, but I've am amazed at how often preachers completely ignore uh, this dimension of the text. Specifically, they are so focused on getting from the text to their contemporary audience that they often allow their own conception of uh, the need that the text addresses to override the text's indications of need. Just for example, um, a, a, a preacher feels like, you know, my I haven't preached on entire sanctification in a long time, and people need to hear a message on entire sanctification. Um, so he goes looking for a text to do what he wants to do. And uh, this re reminds me of a time I wanted to preach on delighting in the Lord. So I thought, I've got a great text, Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And I started to work through the MacDill process, paying attention to the context, and it became clear to me that Psalm 37 was not about delighting in the Lord. The need that the psalm was seeking to address was, what do righteous people do when the bad guys are winning? And it's not about this generic, oh, we need to love God and delight in Him, and let's talk about that. It was a, a very specific uh, need that had to be addressed. So that changed my whole sermon. I preached that back in, um, I think, 2003, and maybe it was 2013, but... Both of those years were years in which the Supreme Court had made decisions that uh, legitimated homosexual behavior. And you know, a lot of people were really discouraged. Uh, and I said, look, here's, here's a psalm that addresses how we respond in the midst of the bad guys winning. Okay. So it, uh, it it's really becomes much more... Uh, it's not just a text to kind of uh, pad a Sunday morning sermon. Again, very relevant. So, uh, this exercise asks you to uh, think beyond the church to include experiences from the world's your audience and habits. Remember the fallen condition of human nature. Allow your own humanity to come through. Address assumptions, symptoms, and consequences, and express compassion and understanding for the hearers. Let me just talk for a moment about the fallen condition of human nature. Okay. Uh, both of the texts that we're preaching from in this class are addressed to Christians. And I think, I could be wrong, maybe you can give me some feedback here, but my sense is that we quote a verse like 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Uh, Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
and that that text then leads people to assume that Christians are all new. Uh, they <clears throat> think, well, we ought, you ought to be perfect, right? Shouldn't you be perfect? You're a Christian. You should be perfect. Well, we say, no, I'm not perfect. God's still working on me. But what about saying you're fallen? It's one thing to say you're not perfect. It's a different thing to say I'm fallen. I'm broken. Okay. And Christians are both fallen and broken. Let me pause there. What questions does making that statement raise for you? Was equivalent to old things and new things have all been broken. So old things is the old way of life. New things is the new way of life. The old way of life was full of anger, wrath, malice, immorality, covetousness, and so on. The new way of life is we're to put those things, we put to death, uh, fornication, adultery, uh, lasciviousness. We put off anger, wrath, malice. But the person on the inside is, according to Colossians 3, 9, and 10, being renewed, your, your mind, that's really who you are on the inside, is being renewed according to the image of God. But it is not yet fully new. Okay. So you have a mind that's been changed. Yes, its desires have been changed. Its orientation has been changed. But not all of its patterns of thinking. Certainly not its habituated responses. Not the way it thought about siblings. Not the way it responded to parents. And these things have to be changed. How many would say there have been times that you found you knew what was right, but you didn't want to do what was right? Even I mean, you knew it was right, and you were going to do what was right, but you didn't want to do what was right. Okay. Well, that, that not wanting is evidence of our brokenness. An unbroken person wants to do what's right, delights in all of these things. So as you think about your audience, some of them are going to not want to do the right that you're preaching about. Even though they may be committed to doing right and may choose to do right. And part of Part of uh, addressing the word of God to our fallen condition is challenging people to bring their broken affections, their wants, to God for his healing. All right, so I have to count it all joy in the midst of problems. I'll do it. Psalm 34.1, I bless the Lord at all times. You know, But obviously there's no want to. But what about uh, having our affections transformed? So, the, the exercise has us first identify the problems, needs, or issues of the original audience the text explicitly addresses. What does the word explicitly mean? Okay, it's right there in the text, black and white. You're not inferring it from the text. The text says it. Okay, so let's work with James. What were the, what are the explicit problems, issues, or needs that are right there in the text? Not necessarily our passage, but in the text of James. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so no, it does not have to be in the subset of the book or letter or whatever that you're talking about, but in the context of the book of James, there are a variety of needs. But well, let's start with the text itself. Did you find any explicit needs in the text? Okay. Knowing how to respond to trials. Knowing how to respond to trials. Okay. Uh, Nick? Uh, they were poor in James 5. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Okay, so that's the broader context. Any other, sorry, in, any in, other in the passage itself needs? Um, okay, is that a need? Need may have been um, that I hadn't thought more. Um, well, let me get what Blake was saying here. Okay. Um, I suppose that's a problem, their faith is being tested. That's at least an issue. Okay. Um, what other issue does verse 4 explicitly address? Remaining steadfastly. Yeah, persevering in the midst of trials. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk for a moment about number 2 here, the implication what needs do the explicit needs necessarily imply? How do the explicit needs relate implicitly to the need to love God and others? What faith-related need does the text imply the audience has? Um, I feel that human nature urges us to feel sorry for ourselves or complain or get angry when uh, facing trials. Okay. Now, in your mind, when you said human nature, was that another way of saying fallen Human nature? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know that your audience will hear fallenness. Okay. No. Chuck, what does uh, what uh, implicit needs did you identify? Uh, I put the uh, lack of faith. Okay. Do you recognize that I'll have the time in trouble? What 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 in the text indicates a lack of faith in your mind? It's a little joy meeting trials by time. So I assume that when I assume that people are struggling to face those trials and come to have joy, which that refers part of the lack of faith. Okay, does this does this passage say that your faith will grow? You'll get more faith? No, what does it say will happen to your faith? The trying of your faith produces what? Is that physical endurance? Spiritual endurance. Is that specifically endurance in faith? Yeah, I think so. It's just like if you stress your bicep, your bicep grows, your tricep doesn't, your forearm doesn't. And so the specific muscle that's being stressed here is the faith muscle. And that's the one that'll, that will develop perseverance. Okay, so I, I would say we can clearly say they need to develop a persevering faith. Is that a universal need? Do all Christians need to develop a persevering faith? All right. <clears throat> so now we've got a, a clear connection between them and us. Okay. Let's go back to number one and look at the wider context of James. What additional needs does the book of James besides poverty indicate? Um, they're being oppressed. Okay, there's oppression in chapter 5. Somebody else. Verse 1 says it's to the tribes of the dispersion. Is that throughout the Roman Empire? Okay, the dispersion is, yes, is a reference to everywhere except Israel. So maybe... But that really doesn't, uh, that's not a new dispersion. The dispersion's been... Um, 
in effect for hundreds of years at this point. Yeah. How about sickness? Doesn't chapter 5, if anyone's sick, okay. let him pray. If you're sick and you're flat on your back, call for the elders. So there's various levels of sickness addressed. General sickness, mm -hmm. critical sickness. All right. Any other uh, needs that you can think of that the text addresses? Um, I want to commentate a little bit. Perhaps in Acts 11.19 that the, these Christians were more than likely exiled um, because of their faith. So they weren't living where they used to live. They got kicked out of, um, I think it was Palestine. Is what he said. Um, it's a theory. That's not. I don't think that's in the book of James. I think they drew that from another passage. Well, so it's true that Christians got kicked out of Jerusalem and scattered. Okay. But that was not called the diaspora. The Greek word diaspora. Uh, did not refer to that event that took place shortly after Pentecost, okay, eight, ten years after Pentecost. Now, the diaspora took place under uh, the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks who deported Jews all around the world. And so you have Paul being able to go to Turkey, being able to go to Greece, and finding synagogues built there. Well, that, you know, they didn't just get there and build a synagogue. They've been there. They're embedded in the cultural structures of the Greco-Roman world. And so I don't see any basis for reading James as addressing solely the Christians booted out of Jerusalem during that time. So were they persecuted? The Jews, the Jewish Christians, yes, they were being persecuted by the Jews. They were getting kicked out of the synagogue. But that would have been true of all the Christians, all, all Jewish Christians. Uh, to become a Christian was to, you know, run into conflict with the synagogue leadership for the most part. Okay, let's uh, shift to 1 Thessalonians 4. What are the needs that the text explicitly addresses for the Corinthians? Uh, the Thessalonians, sorry. Okay, they need to stay away from sexual immorality. Okay, good. Somebody else? We're talking about the needs that they have. Correct. Okay, how to handle or work with their lustful passions. Okay, what else? You don't they need to know how to control their body? All right, there's a need to know. What else? Okay, you need to know that God's call to holiness is a call to purity. That's good. Good. Yes, that they need to know that God takes vengeance on people who defraud their brother. Okay. Are there any wider Thessalonian, book letter of Thessalonian kind of needs that intersect with this text? Is it the issue of holiness? Is there a, is there a theme of, of sanctification throughout the book? There is. He talks about it in chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. He's going to talk about it again in chapter 5. So... 
They, they need to understand and grow in holiness. Okay. All right, how about implicit needs? Probably um, there's a, a pull to be uh, sexually impure or sexual immoral. There's a temptation. All right. So they're going to be tempted. That's universal. It's, it's everywhere in their culture, yeah. In their culture, in our culture? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Does our culture say that uh, consensual sex is nobody's business beside the consenting adults? Yeah. That's what their culture said, too. And, and uh, Paul says, wrong, it's God's business. What you do with your body is God's business. So they need to realize how uh, there's a need to connect their spiritual relationship to their physical behavior. Let me just pull up my exercise and see if I had additional things that I had identified. So the explicit ones I identified, they weren't controlling their lustful passions. We got that. Sexual immorality, we got that. Defrauding of brothers going on. Now maybe. The need to be rewarned. need to understand the implication of being set apart to God. Some appear to be rejecting the warning they've already received, or at least may be inclined to reject Paul's warning. Why would you have to say, if anyone rejects this, he's not rejecting man but God, if you didn't anticipate somebody thinking about rejecting it? Uh, I think we've got a need to know that you don't have to do what you feel like doing. The Gentiles operate according to their passions, but you don't have to operate the way you feel. I, I remember a story being told about a, a pastor who was talking to a young woman who had, who had been involved in immorality and I think was currently living in an uh, immoral relationship. And he said to her, you know, you don't have to do what you feel like doing, don't you? she was shocked. Really? I don't have to do what I feel like doing? I thought I always had to do what I felt like doing. Well, apparently there's somebody whose parents didn't teach them that you can work when you don't feel like it, and you can have a good attitude when you don't feel like it, and you can control your passions when you don't feel like it. Isn't there a need to depend upon the Holy Spirit for enablement implicit in this text? God who gives us his Holy Spirit? I think there's even a need to see God in a certain way. This text teaches us that we should view God as passionate about moral purity. All right, so the third section of exercise 10 is to briefly identify the various kinds of persons whose needs, problems, or issues this text addresses. Use the following categories to describe them. Symptoms, assumptions, consequences, how they feel. Okay, so here's the temptation that most uh, advanced home students counter, they think of one person, they've kind of got this one ideal target in mind, and then they shape the sermon around that. 
I've been saying all the way along, you know, you got to think about more than one person. Right? So, if we have an unmarried secretary in a corporation whose boss is making sexual advances, okay, that's the trouble. What's her, what are her assumptions? What are the possible assumptions, is the way we really ought to say it. Unmarried secretary in the corporation whose boss is making advances. What is her assumptions, her possible assumptions? Yeah. Maybe she has to do what her boss wants. Okay. I, I just saw a, a brief scan of news last night that a star said she felt powerless because of Weinstein's uh, control over movie making. So Weinstein just got busted for all of his sexual harassment and abuse of women, and she felt powerless. So it may be that... that the assumption is, I'm powerless in this situation. Okay. Now, um, there are plenty of women who don't feel powerless in relationships. Okay. So, we can't just assume that that would be the case with a woman. But there are women who so desperately want affection that that desire, that, that need overrides good sense, spiritual thinking, and so on. And it may be that an assumption that would come in here is that he really likes me. He really cares about me. Okay, now, what's the truth? About everybody or anybody who asks another person to commit an immoral act. Okay. Not that good. Love, I'd say that you know, commit male. It's not love, and why isn't it love? Because love would not want that on another person. Love wants what's best for another Love person. wants what's best for another person. It can't possibly be love if they're asking them to do something that's not best for them. So, that may be a audience need, a misconception, assumption that needs to be exploded. And that would apply to uh, teenagers dating, to married people experiencing temptation in the workplace. Okay. It's true that uh, Proverbs highlights the predatory adulteress. And in the book of Proverbs, it's the married woman who lurks and hunts for the precious life. So, don't just think that it's women who are the uh, hapless victim of male aggression. It runs the other way, too. So as we preach this passage, it's brothers and sisters, this is God's call to all of us. Okay. And you may be a Joseph, or you may be a Josephina. Okay. Uh, but in either case, here's what the call of holiness is. Now I do think that 
that just working through this little thought game here, what might be the assumptions, helps expand how I can apply this truth. Okay, I wouldn't thought of exploding the myth of he or she really loves me, except by asking, well, what are the assumptions that a person might bring to this problem? Some of the consequences in his experience. Okay, now, I have uh, probably the most common thing that I see in uh, this exercise in this class is somebody struggling with pornography. Okay, so the trouble he's experiencing is temptation to pornography, underlying assumptions, either I need this or I can't resist this, uh, I'm stuck. The consequences of his experience can be a sense of despair, spiritual failure, I can't make it, how he feels, uh, hopeless, helpless, or maybe he's still in the, he's still in the hiding phase, hoping nobody knows, nobody finds out, don't want anybody to know that I'm struggling with this. But please don't limit your discussion in the sermon to the issue of pornography. Okay? Because Paul doesn't have pornography in, explicitly in mind in this text. I don't have any problem with you referencing Matthew 5.28 as a supporting text. He who looks for the purpose of lusting is uh, commits adultery already in his heart. But... Broader than that. Any questions? Okay, let me take a look at the James text. This would go. This would all go under the application uh, category, right? Yes. Okay. Though sometimes this is there's an argument element here. Because you're helping people see themselves in a new way. You almost feel like this sh should be before the the creation of the sermon so much because we've already done the explanation, application, illustration, argumentation. Do you kind of feel like if this was before that step, that we would be shaping our sermon on that step, kind of in a different attitude, light mindset? Well, I've tried that, and uh, what happens is when people are working on that application, they've got, they've got four things to deal with, explanation, illustration, argumentation, application. And they tend to be, students tend to uh, run out of steam by the application point and tend to have kind of a tunnel vision on application. And I think McDill's purpose and my purpose in retaining his order was to say, okay, you've made a start. That's good. Now let's kind of open the field up here a little and think more broadly because the sermon's not over. Yeah, you've been working on writing it, but you haven't written it yet. Okay. Um, so an application is going to be kind of one of the last things that comes in strongly in the conclusion. Yeah, you may apply as you go along, but it uh, needs to have a very strong component in the, in the conclusion. So, uh, once you get out of this class, you can do the exercises in any order you want to do them. <laughs> now, honestly, how do I do it? I never do this exercise separately. It's always a part of exercises two and three for me. Because I'm thinking about original audience need as I make observations on the text. Okay. But, you know, skills, split them out, develop them, then you compress them later. It's like learning to play the piano. Right hand first, slowly add in the left hand.
and then work on getting stuff crossing over and that kind of stuff. All right. So let me hear just one of your, let's see, Jonathan, let me hear from you. How did you handle number three with the James text? Um, I Okay, did anybody do number three for the James text? Okay, Kale, what'd you do? Number three. I mean, all, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, the symptoms of the trouble he's experiencing um, would be a hardship in his life. Okay. Um, underlying assumptions could be assuming that his trials are a waste of time or that his trials are God's punishment. Okay. Uh, some of the consequences. Um, I didn't really know what consequences. What look for that, but I, I could. I said that it could be distance in his relationship with God, and how he feels at this point. He could be overwhelmed and impatient with God's allowance of trials in his life. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of the consequences are that by not counting it joy, he's experiencing a degree of depression. <laughs> he's experiencing. Uh, Uh, relational challenges because he's upset and that impacts his marriage or his work relations or mm -hmm. okay good yes. uh, Blake I saw you shaking your head yes you've done it what did you have um, for symptoms I had frustrated despair or angry um, and in this Okay. But um, just thinking some of the underlying assumptions might think, why is this happening to me? What did I do to deserve this? When will this end? Yeah, those are good questions. Those are typical. Some of the consequences of his experience, um, I guess this is more to do with what I was thinking. All right. Um, he may feel like, and how he feels at this point, he may feel that no one understands him. He might feel abandoned. Okay. Good. So, I find sounds to me like your uh, work with the the ideas has been fruitful. I think sharing and hearing other ideas can also be fruitful. As you develop skill in this, you um, see a wider range of potential persons who need or problems this text addresses. Now, when I was, I worked on this text in college in Greek, too, second year Greek. I preached this text in my internship at the age of 21, 25 years ago. I, at the age of 21, had experienced very few significant problems in life. The text was still as true when I preached it at 21 as it is when I preached it at 46. But the resonance of the text in my life is quite different now than it was then. Because I've been through some dark valleys. I've been through some far more difficult times than I had been at that point. And There's no way to anticipate or, or create that resonance on your own. So don't lament your stage in life. Be faithful to the text.
apply the text to yourself. And as you grow in your life, go through the valleys that God lets you go through, you'll be like a, uh, you know, the diff what's the difference between a $150 violin and a Stradivarius or an Amati? Well, it, ha it has to do with the way that the wood interacts with the vibrations and the strings. And you get this resonance, a richness of tone. And it's not that the, the cheaper violin can't be played well or be played by a master, but uh, it just mellows and the tone deepens across time. So anticipate that in your own preaching. Don't be frustrated by where you're at now. Uh, and, you know, kind of give up on a text or even give up on preaching simply because you're a newbie. Okay? Everybody's got to be a newbie before they're <laughs> an oldie. All right, well, that's it for today. I hope that was helpful. You're dismissed.